thing I was, I was, you know, a lot of people were asking, who did these masks? Okay. You That's know, how did you get your students to like really we went do to this in, in such a professional way? Some took an extra. This is the one with the raffia and. Yeah. And so we went. Uh, I remember, you know, I used to work. I worked in the museum one year when I graduated. Did I tell you? Mm -hmm. I worked in the Brooklyn Museum. Brooklyn museum? And oh, I used right, to work okay. with the, in the African arts. Okay. And My name is Brenda Green, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Black Literature at McGurvis College. And for the last uh, seven years, I have directed the National Black Writers Conference. Gene Redman was the writer. Oh, he's, okay. a, he's a photographer from. Uh, East St. Louis, mm -hmm. and he's come to every conference but one. So for the 10th anniversary, I said it would be wonderful for you to bring some of his photographs. It looks like that's Maya, Maya Angelou. Yeah, that's Maya that's right here. Wow. This is John Oliver here. Yeah. The National Black Writers Conference is the vision and dream and realization of the late John Oliver Killens. John Oliver Killens believed in bringing black writers together on a yearly basis to talk about the themes in black literature, to talk about the craft of writing, to look at future directions for black literature, and to really um, provide a venue where um, writers could support each other in, in readings and discussion. Reconstructing memory as um, the theme of the conference, and then we heard the thunder, Black Writers Reconstructing Memory and Lighting the Way. And it's kind of what we've been looking at is um, a progression of what's happening in black literature. We can't define black literature in one way. We have to look at it in more complex ways. Storytellers, we keep the story going. All the peoples of the world tell their family stories. It's natural for humans to do. I don't know if other creatures learn and tell their family stories, but I suspect even they do too. All the peoples of the world tell about their homeland. Tell their children what their ancestors and creator have done, uh, uh, what they inspired, what they developed, the great battles they fought, the great victories they won. Then their children understand who and what they are, and what their contribution should be. That's why all the peoples of the world learn and tell their family stories. That's how they pass on their legacy, and what a legacy we have here. And that's what I said when I first came in here. There is a spirit that lives inside of us. It keeps on growing. It never dies. Sometimes when we're afraid, our spirit trembles. Sometimes when we're hurt and ready to give up, it barely flickers. But it keeps on growing. It never dies. I want you to put your arms around yourselves right now. And I want you to love your African selves. I know sometimes we've been away from the motherland so long we don't look African no more. But you go back far enough, it's still there. But you love your African self, love the genius that was given to you. All of these people who came before left us brilliance. Now open your arms, open your arms and embrace an African next to you. Tell them you love them more than you love yourself. Right on, writers. Right on, writers. Right on, you genius people. Yes, love Africans, hug Africans. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Black Writers Conference. Check this out. There was a woman a long time ago who started an underground. Freedom was a name by Harriet's train. She never ever lost a single load. There was a woman a long time ago who started an underground. Freedom was a name by Harriet's train. She never ever lost a single load. Harriet the man didn't mess around. Don't come with me if you ain't really down. Got the Lord and my gun, it ain't no turning back. If you stop, I got to shoot you, cause you know the final tracks. But the way in the water, I feel the way. And like it says in the song that we sing every day. Wade in the water, Wade in the water, children.
My name is Abiyodun Oyewole, and I'm one of the founding members of The Last Poets. And so I was here to try to bring out some poetic juices in our young people at the uh, National Black Writers Conference. Memories are very important when you consider the fact that when we don't remember, it seems we go back into those same cycles that causes us pain and misfortune. So um, to remember our past, to remember how we've come from uh, zero to everything, to remember all of the things we've gone through that have allowed us to be here now is a very important aspect of the development of who we are. In the beginning, there was we and they and others too mournful to be named. So hear that, you know, you know, too mournful to be named. Even though they enslaved us, they were too mournful to be named. They were these young people killing people, right? Or brought before elders, even held in contempt. They were so young in their slaughterings. This European, you know, you know, these Americans are young in their slaughterings. So I say in the beginning, when memory was sound, there was bone smell, blood tear, whisper scream, six, and we arrived carrying flesh and disguise, expecting nothing. That's how we got off those, those slave ships, right? Always searching for gusts of life and, ser and sermons. Eight, in the absence of authentic gods, new memory. For us to survive America, we had to come up with new memory, people. And we, of course, experienced the issue of race uh, differently in, in our different places but we do share a common original culture and, and, and the experience of any member of the, the African diaspora is that for everything we, we acknowledge, we know that there's, you know, for every one person here, we know that there are others um, unseen. Well, I think that even though we were brought to this place called America, that one of the ways that we certainly survive is that we continue to tell our stories. I grew up in Long Island, and I grew up a skinny, light-skinned black kid there, and for most people that means that you grow up privileged. But growing up in Long Island doesn't necessarily mean growing up in a basket of privilege. I grew up in a predominantly black and Latino neighborhood um, that is well known for drug trafficking, um, for violence, for gang violence specifically. Looking at what was going on around me and what was going on within my family, um, growing up around abuse, uh, losing family members at a very early age, um, losing my first cousin who I named my publishing company after, uh, going through cycles of depression. I've been battling depression for about 15 years and dropping out of college because of it. Looking back on all of that, it's very easy to run from it. For a long time, I was a political poet and only talked about the world outside, but reconstructing your memories allows you to take the journey within and to find healing through that. Because the only way you can find healing is through honesty and knowledge of yourself. You know, Toni Morrison talks about this idea remember from dismember. And um, you know, a lot of that is what we do as artists and what that this type of recreation. Um, and this is yet another opportunity to do it in a in a in a community, in a communal way. There was a Times article asking, is the conference necessary? Is the conference relevant? And more importantly, when I was looking at some of the comments after the article, what people were saying, some people just didn't seem to think that a conference like this should be taking place at all. God forbid I should ever answer someone who calls me a black writer. I am a writer, period. The label black makes it clear that non-black views and perspectives are not welcome at the table. They've pigeonholed themselves with a restrictive, self-defeating label and in doing so have eliminated the vast majority of their potential audience. Part of the reason it's important to focus on black literature and call it that is because the experiences are different. I had an opportunity to be with at least four or five writers, you know, from the continent and two or three from the, uh, from the Caribbean and a couple from Latin America. And we all had a common concern about the kind of globalization and you know, what's going on with that and to how, how critically are we dealing with that fictionally and non-fictionally. A conference like this is important because it brings together uh, different writers, 
it brings together above all students and, and people who also write and sometimes people who have not published and people who are publishing their own th themselves. Uh, we bring everybody together in the workshop atmosphere and we're saying, hey, we're one and the same. We're here, we're learning from each other. I'm just really excited to be here. This is my first year in New York City. So to, to be here with so many people, so many authors, um, I haven't published anything. So I'm really hoping to just learn a lot from what I hear and to be inspired to create uh, powerful stories that really represent uh, African Americans and African American culture well. The panels at the Black Writing Conference help to inform my work because it lets me know the broader picture of what's going out there, uh, out there. not only today, the new voices like myself and my husband um, and other new voices that I've had the opportunity to hear and meet, but also it gives me kind of a historic background on some of the things and the people and the voices and the stories that have come before. It's important for conferences like this. It's important for African people African-American people, people from all over the diaspora who share this idea of, of being black and being black in society to be able to meet and, you know, just talk about the issues, talk about it, write us to meet because we're all writing from the same source and irrespective of where we come from in that milieu, it all goes back to the African continent, the motherland. So we need this conference as part of maybe other things, you know, similar to it, that we can have that healing. My pen hangs hesitant, the turgid promise of ink, I'm sure. What does one do when the events, episodes, anecdotes of a life swirl indecipherable in pools of sins you never forgave your mother for? Every time I think I have recovered from some old wound, another season returns, knife-like, and the gash reopens as it happened yesterday. People rarely just read literature for information. You know, people don't buy fiction, and definitely they don't buy memoir just to get information. They buy these stories to find a way forward. You know, to quote Alice Walker's um, book, the only way forward is with a broken heart. It's that you, you, you can have a broken heart, you can have a broken body, a broken spirit, and survive it, because everyone walks through things that break them. And literature is what made me know that I could survive. That spirit of survival is present in Toni Morrison's work. That spirit of survival is, is you know, that, that, that spirit of resistance is present in Kamal Brathwaite's work. And, and that, that is that universal chord that needs to be struck in literature for us to, to find a way forward with these broken hearts. Is this Arthur Bennett Hall? <laughs> You have used politics, race, and social economic issues to, to the forefront of your writing. What are you seeing in younger writers coming along behind you? Are they, are they stepping up to the plate doing the same types of writing that you were doing? Some are, some not. I mean, you know, it's like everything else. Everything is the same in that way. There's a small group of people who are progressive, a small group of people who are very backward, and the people in the middle are in the middle. And I think it's our task to try to win a lot of those in the middle so they take more progressive steps. But young writers have to be aware of the kind of uh, virulent racism that's going on today, uh, what's happening now is the same as the overthrow of Reconstruction. This, is, this might as well be the 19th century. I think, I think that right now the young writers are grappling. The age of Obama is very confusing. It's obfuscating. There's a lot of obscurity out there. What does it mean to be a human being in black skin? What does it mean to be writing at the end of the American empire, at least as an empire seems to be in relative decline, the culture in relative decay, and the government in relative brokenness? How do you confront that? 
how do you relate to a black community that in some ways is rendered invisible because of the visibility of its successful person, like Brother Barack Obama, charismatic, charismatic, brilliant, and so forth, but so much of the focus is on him, very little focus on the prison industrial complex, very little focus on the poor children locked into the disgraceful schools and so forth. So the question is, how do you sustain that kind of link? <laughs> The important person here for me, all of them are important, but Johnny Barnes, who often, this is a pool hall here. You can see the billards and stuff. For me, uh, when I say a black writer, the first person I think of is myself. You know, I'm certainly, I'm black <laughs> and I write. I teach here at City College. I teach the history of Harlem. And in the uh, fall, I do a history of the civil rights movement. Malcolm X, Malcolm Little, Detroit Red, Satan, all the other kind of the monikers he had. When he was 16 years old, he had a deep desire to come to Harlem. My activism goes back to the 60s. It was almost automatic for us to have the activism, less to do with how much money you make, but what can you do to bring about change? Well, the attitude has changed on that. It's now like, hey, I gotta take care of myself and maybe I'll get to the activism later. Some of these classrooms you walk in, the most radical person in there is the, is the instructor. Well, when I first started, I wanted to use my pen as a, a, a blowtorch and burn the country down. And we, we, were, we were up in arms, you know, we were like, our afros were large, our clothes were African, our names were changing. We were seriously about a whole cultural makeover of the society with black being at the top of the list. I remember when I was asked many years ago, how did I write? I said, why did I write? I said, I wanted to tell people how, how I became this woman with razor blades between her teeth. Uh, a lot of our young people are not aware of this history. So if you start doing the numbers game with a lot of things out there in terms of the po political arena, the number of elected officials, you got a black president now, all of this is a result of the civil rights movement. You, you can't deny that. You know, we put a lot of pressure to bring about change and the only way we could do that was like taking to the streets. So we have to begin to teach them, you know, hey, here's some victories we got out of this thing and the need to have you there to continue to struggle. So they need to, to learn that, as Frantz Fanon said, you know, that uh, each generation out of relative obscurity must either betray or fulfill their mission. Our slogan is Read, Write, Revolt, and that's because we see the, the role of literature as an important part of activism and all the steps that, that you take towards um, revolution. I think that, um, that there are a lot of things that are happening that are different now than were happening in, in movements at other times, but I see a lot of, a lot of energy um, and a lot of fire in, in ways that we didn't see before. People aren't taking to the streets to the same extent that they were taking to the streets but I, I wouldn't be willing to say that the fire is out. As a journalism major, I do a lot of stories that affect the community and the area that I'm in, Philadelphia, is predominantly black. So a lot of the writing, it's, I guess I would do more of a social writing. I talk about the problems in Philadelphia. My husband and I are parents of seven. And so we have learned a lot from that experience of being a parent, and that it's, we've learned a lot from our children. And about four years ago, we found that there was a lot of negative um, images and messages that were available for children. And we just felt the need to contribute in a positive way. Uh, we wanted to create a children's book line that had uh, more multicultural images and just sharing uh, different tools for children uh, in a different perspective. You, what's going on right now? We had the event with Talib Kweli and Gil Scott Harris for the Black Writers Music Conference event in downtown Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? Live and direct. Music belongs at a writers conference most definitely because I'm an artist myself, a rapper slash poet, an MC. But I write about struggle, I write about pain, sometimes I like making people laugh. 
Like I might write about jokes. It, it depends what I feel. Do the math for starters. Um, that was actually a poem written for ladies because I am a mentor to the youth and I see so often that they feel like they have to be second best in order to be with someone. And that's just a poem to encourage them that they don't have to be second best. In a, in a lot of people's minds, you know, when you say black literature, they, they think African-American literature. Um, but more and more, I think there's, a, there's an acknowledgement of uh, the mixture and the influences of one upon the other of African-American literature on African and African diaspora literature. My novel is an immigrant story, right? But a particular experience of certain types of immigrants here in New York City. Me in particular, I actually was born in London. I grew up in Trinidad. I lived in Canada and then I came to Medgar. You know, so for me that even right there saying that people just kind of, sometimes they don't even come on a straight path. We're aware of black writers, not only from the United States, not only from the West Coast, but from across the seas, and they're saying and dealing with the same issues that black writers here have been dealing with. I think the 10th anniversary uh, conference, by look, the kinds of themes we use, really speaks to the idea of looking at black literature and what constitutes the writing of black writers in more global ways. And so I ask you as writers, one, how do you think that Right. How do you think that being writers have, has shifted your identity? That's one side of it. And the other side is how do you deal with the issue that people will look to your writings and try to seek identity in, in a shifting and growing way? How do you deal with that? Being, being a writer makes you a, a constantly curious person. So in a way, it's a continuity in this shift, in this, in this fluid journey. Today I was a panelist on a panel called Shifting Identities, um, Black Writers in the African Diaspora. I was born in Haiti in the late 1960s, and my mother and father moved to the United States, my father when I was two, my mother when I was four, and I joined them here when I was 12. So I've been living um, in the U.S. since I was 12. I speak Creole in French, and um, I write in English. So I am an immigrant person and an immigrant writer. When you're looking at writers, you need to look at the totality of literature and study the totality of literature. It's really important to not only investigate black fiction and black nonfiction from America, but to broaden it to a post-colonial perspective because we've all been affected by the same things. Not only is our lineage, our great lineage of past shared and our great horrific lineage shared, but we need to make sure that we also understand how things are still connected today and they still are currently. And we're attempting, we're screaming at each other across oceans and it's really important to sometimes slow down enough to be able to listen.